My name is Gülay Özkan. I'm an entrepreneur based in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, today I have Duncan Clark here. He's the chairman and the founder of BDA China, which is a consultancy company uh, in China. He's also a visiting scholar at uh, Stanford University at the program of Regions of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Actually, he has uh, he just held the China 2.0 event last week, and right after now he's in Istanbul, and I didn't want to miss the chance to talk to him about his entrepreneurial experience. Uh, Duncan, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I know your entrepreneurial story uh, quite in detail, but uh, uh, for those who don't know you, uh, what brought you to China in back in '94 and start your own company? Sure. Well, before I was uh, in China, I was an investment banker. I was working with Morgan Stanley in London. And in 1993, I was transferred to Hong Kong and focusing on the telecom media technology sector. I had been working in Europe for three years like in, the t in the telecom sector there. And in 93, uh, you know, Asia was becoming interesting. Uh, but China was really an unknown uh, thing. I mean, basically, nobody could even meet the government officials to understand what was happening in communications. And so I moved there in 94, set up BDA to help companies invest in the Chinese telecoms market and then ultimately also the technology and media sector. So I went for one year and I've been there for 17 years actually. And it's the growth of the mobile communications and the internet has really exploded. Uh, that really kept me there. In 94, when I moved to China, there were 1 million mobile phone users. Today, we just surpassed uh, you know, 900 million. I think the internet is half a billion users last week. So uh, China has grew very fast, very quick. And uh, you have witnessed all this market evolution. Yeah, I've been there through. I bought the first, you know, mobile phones when they were, you know, three thousand dollars and you know, big as a brick, you know. So, and today, of course, we know that iPhone and everything is very popular uh, in, in China. So. Uh, how did you overcome your most difficult days? Did you have any mentors, any advisors? No, I mean, I, I mean, the irony is when I moved to China, most other people there were not entrepreneurs. Um, mm -hmm in terms of the foreign community there. They were diplomats, journalists, they were sent by multinational companies with big expat packages. So the nice thing is I had to just figure it out myself, actually. I think the more you know you learn about risk, the less you are likely to try something, um, mm -hmm. what you call analysis paralysis. You know, if you overanalyze, and if you try to follow a model, it may not be right for you. So I think it was Thomas Edison was once asked what advice he has for young people. And he said, none, you know, young people don't take advice. And when I was 25 years old, when I saw the company, yeah, I wasn't going to listen to anybody. <laughs> okay. And uh, after 17, 18 years, yeah. and you were invited by Stanford yes. uh, to share your experience. And uh, now you have the chance to, to compare entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem in, in Silicon Valley and yes. in China. That's right. How, how do you see these two different uh, markets? Well, China is interesting for Silicon Valley in that um, uh, some of the most prestigious venture capital firms in Silicon Valley have never set up offices overseas, not even in Europe or anywhere. But uh, in China, we see firms like Kleiner Perkins and others, the really sort of tier one Silicon Valley firms have actually set up in, in China mm -hmm. because I think they recognize the size of the opportunity. There was an old saying in Silicon Valley that you never invest in a company that you cannot drive to. You know, so maybe you drive to Menlo Park or you drive okay. to San Jose. Uh, you can't <laughs> drive China. to China. <laughs> so, um, and people have realized to be in China is important um, because of the size of the market. I mean, the Chinese internet market, for example, is twice the size of the U.S. Mm -hmm. in terms of population. Obviously, not in value yet, but it's coming very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Silicon Valley is is increasingly recognizing that China is a source of opportunity. It's potentially a source of threat for companies that don't manage to succeed in, in China. Um, we've seen this with the internet sector, and that's one thing we're focusing on at Stanford at this China 2.0 program. Why is it that companies, whether it's eBay or Yahoo or Google, uh, have not succeeded in China? Now, of course, part of that is to do with government restrictions and regulation and censorship. But also, we see some amazingly talented entrepreneurs in China mm -hmm. who now have access to capital. Um, from Silicon Valley funds or from domestic funds who are now beginning to expand overseas. So last Friday at our conference at Stanford, we had Jack Ma uh, indicating that he wants to buy the whole of Yahoo. You know, okay. um, <laughs> So China has grown up now. And among the emerging markets, which markets you see really promising? And well, maybe of course, Turkey. <laughs> sure, sure. No, I mean, I think um, I mean, I, I'm a partner in a, in a mobile games company, which is based in China, but actually isn't uh, run yeah. by Chinese. Mm -hmm. It's run by a Norwegian, a Malaysian, and an American. Mm -hmm. And their biggest market is the Middle East. And, uh, you know, High Noon is, a, is their game. It's very successful in, in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. And I think they had not even planned to be in those emerging markets. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think 
the reason I mention this is that with the Apple uh, App Store, uh, for example, the world is becoming flat. You know, a company anywhere in the world, if they launch, say, a successful application uh, or a game, can have customers, you know, without even knowing where they are. Um, so I think the emerging market opportunity is becoming much more interesting now because in the past it's very difficult for entrepreneurs in one area of the world to really set up overseas without tremendous uh, financial risk and, and, and legal help. So I think because of the internet and because of app stores particularly, we are seeing emerging markets uh, taking a very interesting role both in being consumers of uh, products, but also in generating uh, applications and, and ideas. So I think I think I'm pretty optimistic now. Wherever there's young people where, who are well educated, uh, and Turkey is one example. In the Middle East, is seeing a lot. I mean, you know, the, the events of the last year have shown us that you know there is a, a burgeoning younger class, uh, uh, urbanized, uh, increasingly well educated. You know, these are all potential entrepreneurs or consumers. You know of entrepreneurial ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the Middle East and the entrepreneurial world is, are increasingly fusing. So Silicon Valley is a valley um, and uh, for several generations of uh, innovation in Silicon Valley it was really concentrated there. Uh, for example semiconductors or then software mm -hmm. or the internet and social networking. But now we can say that we're beyond the valley. I mean that okay. these are global phenomena for example in environmental technologies or now in mobile social networking, for example, or other areas, because the world is suddenly much more interconnected. So emerging markets play a very important role now in entrepreneurs' thinking. When they start a company today in Silicon Valley, they may already be thinking about China or other emerging markets. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I know that you have been in Istanbul quite many yes. times in Turkey, but uh, have you been in Middle East? Uh, I've spent some time just in, in Dubai, um, mm -hmm. but I need to spend more time uh, in the region. Mm -hmm. um, being based in China and in Silicon Valley, there's you know I see some interesting things. Uh, Chinese investment into the Middle East uh, obviously is, is booming, um, particularly in terms of the infrastructure level. Okay. Uh, so companies like Huawei, which I cover, yeah. are big suppliers, of, you know, equipment, etc. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't yet seen that much Chinese investment in say services and content, but that's coming. For example. Firms like Baidu have indicated their interest in, in the region. So I think we're going to see more Chinese investment in, the, in that region. I think in terms of Silicon Valley as well, you know, the world is open for entrepreneurs uh, from, from anywhere. Um, and I think that you're going to see much more activity linking uh, not just the traditional centers of the West, you know, sort of the London, San Francisco, New York, Tokyo kind of continuum. Today we see much more interrelationship, like the South-South. So it might be Brazilian investors in, in, you know, in, in, in South Africa and Chinese investments in, in, in Latin America. We're seeing it much more connected. So, so I think the Middle East will play, I mean, wherever there's a smart idea in the world, you know, now there's a greater opportunity for it to be discovered. Um, Silicon Valley still offers the best nurturing, let's say, particularly for early stage financing. And that's the big challenge, even in China, yeah, you know, getting people, you know, angel investment, they say, is for friends, family and fools, you know, mm -hmm. if people are prepared to take that risk. Um, so I think increasingly, though, it's becoming a respectable profession. For example, in China, to be an entrepreneur uh, now, uh, there's enough parents who've seen that, you know, the classmates of their kids have made, made money in, as an entrepreneur, not just taking the safe option. And I'm sure the same will, will be, the, be true in the Middle East. Is there any lessons learned from China that you think that can be applied in the Middle East region? Well, I mean, China to some extent is unique because of its sheer scale. I mean, China has a combination of uh, supply of talent and this massive market and capital. I mean, it's not short for capital. Um, I think in the Middle East, obviously, uh, you have uh, talent uh, and you have capital, but the markets uh, are quite fragmented still and you have differences of language, etc. I mean, China has this benefit of being this one even though there's regional differences, but you have one common language. And so I think it's, we should be cautious about saying, I want to do what China did. And I, mm -hmm. for example, I spent some time in India and I set up a business in India, which we sold last year. Um, but China and India are extremely different. I mean, both large countries, but very different uh, dynamics in terms of, for example, infrastructure. The Indian mobile infrastructure is still much further behind. Uh, tremendous in Indian entrepreneurial talent, but a lot of it is funneled in different ways than in China. So, so I think we have to be cautious about trying to copycat. Um, one thing I think is true, wherever you are in the world, you should be thinking about China. 
as uh, an opportunity, but also a potential source of competition. <laughs> uh, the very fact that Jack Ma's company is called Alibaba and he's, uh, he's not from the Middle East is you know, it's, it's an illustration of that. How about uh, for entrepreneurs? So what are your recommendations for entrepreneurs in an emerging market? Well, I think in the, in the Middle East and in the world in general now, uh, we're so much more interconnected that I think mm -hmm. you can learn a lot from people who you never meet. I mean, that's becoming increasingly common. Uh, through discovering of business models elsewhere. I mean, the difference between a, a startup in Silicon Valley and you know one in China or elsewhere in an emerging market is a, a few days, you know, because information travels so fast. Uh, but I think learning how to adapt to your local market, really know your customer. There's, there's nothing uh, like that, and don't be too afraid of other players entering the market if you know the market better than them. So. So I think the key thing is to overcome the challenges of maybe less capital available or less infrastructure, but also play to your strengths, which is knowing the customer, knowing the local market. So do your homework. Yeah.